Hello, my name is Susan Lord. I'm a professor of film and media in the Department of um, Film and Media at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. I'm uh, speaking to you today from the lands of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. Um, I am very grateful to the ancestors, uh, to my current neighbors and friends who are the Indigenous caretakers of this land for the care that they have given to the lands and waters. Uh, and to the hospitality that they give to the settlers who are currently living here, such as myself. I'm here today to talk to you about a project that is uh, brand new. And um, so this is really about what we hope will come. And we really look forward to hearing from you um, ideas and critiques that you have to help us uh, move forward with this project. Um, it will unroll over the next four years. The title is here on the screen, Under the Shadow of Empire, Minor Archives and Radical Distribution Networks in the Americas. And we're looking at the period between 1960 and uh, the internet, um, the early 90s. We're looking really at the distribution records of hand-to-hand, um, uh, -hand, person to person um, counter-public, uh, activities around media that took place in the Americas during that period, crossing borders of all kinds. The team, uh, you will meet two of them today. Uh, the team is listed also here. So we have um, uh, Amalia Cordova from the uh, Smithsonian, uh, Zyra Zarza, who will uh, speak today as well, um, from the University of Montreal. Juana Suarez from New York, uh, from NYU, from New York University. Gabriel Minotti, who is from Queens and one of the organizers of this event. So he's not speaking with us today, but he is, uh, he is here. Um, and Tamara Lang, who is speaking today uh, also from Queens. The project is uh, located in the Vulnerable Media Lab at Queens University, which has uh, had the great fortune of receiving um, uh, Canadian Foundation for Innovation funding to build an infrastructure that is uh, dedicated to the preservation, migration, repatriation, uh, and uh, remediation of audiovisual heritage by women, Indigenous, uh, Afro-descendant, LGBTQ2, and Latinx uh, makers, collectives, uh, and community-based collections. The Archive Counter Archive project is one of our uh, uh, ongoing activities in the lab, and uh, it's a Canadian-based project, and it was an inspiration for this one that we're doing now uh, because of the incredible uh, network that has developed, but also because of the work of preservation and access that's happening through the ACA. I recommend people to go online and take a look at what that project is doing. And the Vulnerable Media Lab is part of a network of um, uh, it, throughout the Americas of um, labs, of um, media arts organizations, and it's growing uh, as we literally, as we speak. So the word vulnerability is one that I want to attend to a little bit um, before we move forward. Um, the Vulnerable Media Lab is dedicated to um, thinking about and researching media vulnerabilities, um, but uh, in various uh, in various ways. We're, you know, um, the obvious uh, vulnerabilities of, uh, uh, as this slide is showing here, Chilean soldier carrying documents for burning, um, the neglect that takes place for media makers who are um, uh, operating in uh, counter-public uh, environments, um, who are uh, political actors during periods of, um, of political hostility, uh, the vulnerabilities facing the media uh, heritage of Indigenous um, makers whose, uh, whose um, work is uh, either neglected, ignored, or incarcerated in, um, in national uh, archives. 
Um, and then, of course, there are the vulnerabilities that um, are faced um, in terms of climate and uh, location, which, of it, which then itself intersects with economic and, uh, and social uh, vulnerabilities. So one element of our project is to think about infrastructure sharing. This slide um, is an image uh, from a, a fantastic paper about the, um, uh, about the, the conditions of uh, certain archives in, uh, in this case, at the, the, the Cinemateca of, Cu of uh, Cuba. Uh, the condition of many archives, of community-based archives, as well as even national ones um, in the global south, mean that the the material, um, uh, the mycology, uh, the material conditions of those archives are in really serious uh, need of um, of care. But rather than trying to operate uh, in a traditional model where the first world center is the center of activity, we're taking our uh, lesson from uh, projects like a, such as APEX, which is, um, uh, which is uh, generated out of the Moving Image and Archive program that Juana Suarez uh, oversees, is the director of. Uh, the APEX program um, uh, works with uh, collections and collectives, organizations, uh, throughout the Americas, um, and in fact, uh, even internationally, uh, to go to places with um, a small team and to work with the community there to help um, uh, them develop uh, the tools and infrastructure that they need in order to care for their own, um, their own projects. In this way, we are dedicated to the um, to knowledge sovereignty, and I'll speak a bit about that uh, uh, in a bit. Under the Shadow of Empire um, investigates, therefore, the or proposes to investigate the pre-internet history of minor and radical media distribution networks, archival nodes and collections in the Americas. And the temporal scope, as I mentioned, goes from the 60s to the late 90s. The, one of the reasons for that uh, is that um, now with, um, uh, with a robust uh, digital infrastructure of uh, sharing that's happening through um, media that's been made uh, as digital objects, uh, media that is um, that is uh, transmitted, that is shared, that is distributed through through um, uh, the internet. That uh, is being studied actually quite uh, quite a bit by researchers now. And although there's a lot of instability in the um, in the preservation of um, or the future of certain kinds of digital platforms and objects, as we know, <clears throat> the issues facing the um, the analog uh, records are really quite shocking, and I was uh, in the midst of a introduction to a book about Sara Gomez, the Cuban filmmaker, an introduction to an anthology that we've just published, and I wanted to, um, in that introduction, detail the ways in which her films moved through the Americas, moved through. Uh, Canada, the United States, through Mexico, uh, through Brazil, where we know it did show some, especially uh, the feature film. However, there are no actual records of where those uh, films showed up. We know who the distributors were in certain cases, Tricontinental, for example, in the US and IDERA in Canada, but those organizations have um, have uh, ended their their uh, their active lives, and they um, don't have paper records of the distribution. What we lose then, when we lose that paper record, is we lose um, an understanding of the counterpublics, uh, church basements, um, 
uh, venues of that were informal that are outside of the scope of uh, film festivals and cine clubs. <coughs> that is, public spheres or emerging uh, uh, publics or uh, radical alternative publics that were uh, very much part of the active um, uh, environment of social change and uh, media uh, innovation during the period that we're looking at. So um, what we want to do is study and document the history uh, of, of and relationships between the minor archives, uh, the media distribution, and those counter publics, and to strengthen and extend our networks and collaboration between researchers, community media, uh, archives and collections, and the distribution organizations. We want to develop a methodology that is um, tied to the idea and really generated from and toward the idea of the living archive. In this sense, uh, we are um, trying to live to the to the word and the, uh, the um, a commitment to knowledge sovereignty. In this way, the methodology would address differ, uh, you know, a differential set of best practices and protocols for preservation, data visualization, metadata development, and access to audiovisual media histories produced and held across a diverse range, range of social, political, environmental and technological localities. <coughs> but as we um, are coming to know, and many some researchers are uh, doing incredible work on, the idea of the living archive as a practice requires um, an expanded sense of preservation, wherein performance is not just a vault, wherein preservation is not just a vault, uh, but is a presentation. Um, a performance, a remediation, and a public airing. And that any metadata description uh, that is tied to the archive uh, that we are um, hoping to maintain um, and generate uh, the conditions of living for, any of that uh, metadata must be um, just must be written by, must be authorized by the communities out of which it comes. That introduces a, a number of terrific problems um, and so interesting as we're doing currently in our lab working with the um, archive of uh, Arnate, which is the Inuit women's uh, video uh, production group uh, based in Igloolik and Montreal. We're working to uh, create um, the conditions whereby they are able to generate their own metadata in their own language. And then the, um, the archive at Queen's where the media is held will be in, in, Nuktatuk, in uh, English and in French. And uh, because in many of these instances of uh, community-based uh, practice, the memory, uh, the cultural memory and, and community is very intergenerational. And those intergenerations do not all speak the same language. So it is also a capacity building project in this sense that uh, both language and uh, media memory are being um, uh, um, enlivened and, uh, and, in, and their future extended. So with this in mind, we are, um, uh, we are uh, looking at uh, some uh, large, large uh, questions, large scale questions, uh, three kind of principled contextualized uh, contextual questions that emerge in the face of the deteriorating and inaccessible cultural heritage of media holdings and distribution histories in the Americas. How do we face that urgency with a method that is underpinned and shaped by principles of decolonization and sovereignty? 
How do we produce best practices in the face of extreme instability of social, political, and environmental contexts that condition specific archives and collections? And how do we create conditions of access uh, to cultural heritage uh, that acknowledge intersectional forms of oppression and struggles for liberation and cultural sovereignty? So the project is inspired by the history of collective risk-taking by people with cameras in the second half of the 20th century. Their interventions are stories of life under the shadow of empire, as well as uh, documentation of political power and financial control that shaped the state and social violence. In some cases, the legacy of these collective acts has a long reach in time and space, offering models uh, for um, subsequent generations of media makers. Their work uh, both um, inspired the development of and disseminated and was disseminated through radical international net networks of production and uh, uh, distribution. The nodes of these networks become minor archives, de facto holdings, and collections of the media itself. However, rarely are these alternative distribution histories and stories and minor uh, archives documented in a form that offers robust public access and renewal or remediation of the practices, techniques, and social engagement. And moreover, the media that has slipped out of view um, it, hidden in minor archives uh, is at risk of becoming permanently inaccessible to, uh, due to material, environmental, and political reasons. So that's our urgency. In our methodology, we have, uh, we've, we've decided on a set of arenas or case studies, um, one of which is uh, solidarity um, organizations, NGOs, such as IDERA in, uh, in, in um, Canada, or DEC, the Development Education um, initiative, uh, initiative that then held full frame uh, films in, in Toronto. Um, we also are, you know, very much aware that uh, thankfully Third World Newsreel um, and uh, its uh, San Fran in its San Francisco uh, um, uh, activities continue to continues to exist and will be one of those uh, um, very helpful archives for us to work with, and it has been written about uh, also, which is terrific. Um, and uh, uh, other uh, organizations in this solidarity NGO uh, uh, um, state are, as I mentioned, the um, uh, Tricontinental Film Center, uh, which um, uh, has, uh, is, it doesn't any longer exist. And as I mentioned, some of its records are, um, uh, many of its records don't, uh, don't, paper records don't exist either. We're also looking at a set of, um, of uh, media arts organizations and initiatives uh, like uh, Vivo, which is uh, which is is based in Vancouver, exists um, and is an amazing archive itself. It's a kind of model for uh, housing um, other archives, um, uh, community-based projects, not just those of the that uh, that that Vivo itself produced. But we're also going to look at, uh, the, at for example, the Cinemateca de Bogota, which has um, uh, minor archives inside its large Cinemateca. Uh, and those minor archives um, are undocumented and uh, under-resourced. And so our, our work there would be to, um, to create uh, records and, um, and, some, um, and work with the Cinemateca to do um, some um, digitization. We also have a number of uh, Indigenous media projects that we're considering, and uh, I'm going to focus uh, my remarks a little bit right now on um, uh, Video Nas Algias, which is, uh, which is the uh, Video in the Villages project uh, based in Brazil. Um, this uh, project uh, is, as many of you will probably know, one of the one of the largest um, uh, uh, archives uh, and and production uh, initiatives um, undertaken 
uh, by Vincent Corelli, uh, started um, in the in 19 launched in 1987, um, and it houses about 8,000 hours of material produced by and in collaboration with over 40 Indigenous peoples in the region, and that collection is um, in a very precarious uh, situation. They have a great website and um, now and uh, a kind of videoteca, so you can go in and rent work, which I encourage everyone to do. But uh, we're going to work with, uh, with them to um, uh, uh, collaborate on some infrastructure sharing and to do some work with, uh, with the collection itself uh, to do preservation and uh, long-term storage and uh, and um, uh, as well as, of course, note the um, and record the uh, the uh, distribution uh, history. Um, we're also looking at a series of collectives, collections, and individuals um, whose work um, represents some of the most um, complex, socially uh, and materially complex. Uh, uh, collections that uh, that we're going to look at. Af uh, in particular, for example, Afro-descendant uh, collections such as Gloria Orlando in Cuba, who is an independent maker. This is a photograph of her archive, which is in her house, which is very close to the Malacon, which is the seawall in Havana, um, and the sea often creeps up her street. So the condition of vulnerability of her actual um, uh, collection there is uh, pretty serious. Um, her work has been distributed and shown um, throughout uh, uh, the, the Caribbean and, uh, and uh, throughout the Americas, uh, but it, there isn't a story of its distribution. So this is, a, this is one, of our, one of our case studies. As well, linked to that, the next generation, and I know that we're in the internet when, and Zyra will speak about this in her presentation, but the uh, archive of, um, uh, of Cuban cinemas of the diaspora and how to, uh, Zyra's project is very much dedicated to uh, creating archival records of these, uh, of these works and their distribution. Um, uh, Tamara Lang's projects, um, uh, incredible project that she's doing in various organizations across uh, across Canada and the U.S. will extend uh, into and through this, uh, um, the, the, um, our, our collective project here, this idea of queer atmospheres where uh, community-based collections um, are spaces that, uh, that offer uh, community meaning and value. Um, and the minor archives that are held in major collections, such as the one collection that's uh, in Los Angeles. These are um, uh, examples of, um, of nodes, of uh, holdings that are, that are made by um, the communities that, um, that have uh, held, collected, shared, um, and, um, and cared for. Um, the 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 history of queer of queer um, um, queer life. Um, there are a number of um, organizations that are dedicated to, in particular, to women's um, uh, presence in the political and social uh, activisms of the 1970s through the 90s um, in Brazil um, and uh, in. Um, Colombia, in Mexico, and so there are specific uh, organizations that we've uh, chosen to look at there. Finally, uh, my time is quite up. I'm going to very quickly just tell you a little bit about what we're hoping will be an outcome. Um, um, there are a couple of wonderful models that we're using um, as a basis for creating our mobile, um, our media mapping. That of these um, of this uh, of these records and uh, and um, archives, including this uh, this one, which is the mapping uh, mapping the independent media community, which is um, located in the United States and is still very North American and European based, but clearly has a great deal of potential. And we look forward to collaborating 
um, with the, the folks who have started that project. Um, Elisa Lebeau's a beautiful uh, project uh, about filmmaking in Egypt um, uh, is one of the inspi most inspiring um, uh, examples of using data visualization to generate uh, longitudinal uh, and um, uh, both horizontal and vertical histories. And um, here's a, a, a wonderful local project based in Vancouver that maps um, a particular history of uh, feminist engagement in um, and through um, media and art uh, production um, linked to social uh, activisms and uh, social um, uh, actors in the 1970s. So that's all I have to say, and my time is up, and I'm really uh, grateful for any, uh, to hear any feedback and questions. Thank you.